gone gone live so welcome to everybody um i'm just going to give it another minute or so just for other people to join uh, just in case they're a little bit late but welcome to everyone that's just joined us on this live webinar and we'll get going very shortly still got one or two people joining so we'll just give it another 30 seconds or so. OK, so welcome everybody to this uh, live webinar event. Uh, my name is Dr Alan Merchant. I'm the Deputy Head of School for Education in Biological Sciences here at the University of Southampton. And today what we're going to, well, we're going to hear from Professor Amrit Muda and um, she's going to tell us all about her research that she's been doing and really trying to answer the question you know what can the humble fruit fly uh, tell us about alzheimer's disease and all of the work that amrit's been doing to try and answer questions about this really important disease that affects society so just to tell you a little bit about amrit um, so she did her um, undergraduate degree at king's college in london in biomedical sciences and then from there she went on to do a phd at oxford and is currently a professor at the University of Southampton in Biological Sciences, and she's a professor of neuroscience. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just hand over to Amrit, and she's going to um, talk to you about her research for about the next 35 minutes, and then we'll have the opportunity for questions um, after that. If you have any questions that you would like to ask during the talk, if you can put those into the chat, and then we'll, we'll be able to deal with those and answer those at the end of the talk. So I'll hand over now to Amrit and look very look forward very much to, to her talk. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to uh, this uh, webinar series. And um, uh, some of you are offer holders who uh, are um, thinking about whether or not you want to join us at the University of Southampton. Others have heard about this webinar series through your school's network or through uh, other networks of friends. And really the idea behind setting up this series is to enable you to appreciate what a scientist does, what a biomedical scientist does, and how if you study biomedical sciences or a degree within uh, the biological sciences uh, uh, area overall, biology, zoology, pharmacology, neurosciences, whatever your degree may be, you can also do something about uh, important you can also address important uh, issues that affect our society so when i was at your stage i uh, was very interested in the human body and in how the human body changes especially in disease and how uh, doctors can treat that and my sixth form advisors told me that i should then go on to do medicine and i worked very hard got into medical school and realized shortly after starting medical school that actually that's not what I really wanted to do. Medicine is not about really trying to work out how a normal cell becomes abnormal and how that leads to disease. Medicine is about recognizing the symptoms of disease and uh, remembering how those symptoms are treated with the treatments that have been developed by somebody else. If I wanted to really understand how the disease appears in the first place, how a cell gets sick and how you can use that knowledge to identify drug targets, then I would need to study something else. And that something else was any other degree program in biological sciences, such as biomedical sciences. So I left medical school after two months and I moved over to do biomedical sciences. And I realized as I did my degree that yes, I can actually make a difference in exactly the same way as I would have done as a doctor, except that I would now be understanding how the normal nerve cell gets sick because I realized as I did biomedical sciences that it was the brain and diseases of the brain that were really interesting to me. And I realized that I could actually better understand how nerve cells get sick. I could better understand how that leads to the clinical symptoms of disease. And I could use that knowledge to um, identify drug targets that could potentially be useful and helpful to treat patients. And that information and knowledge drug target would get handed over to the doctor who would then deliver the medication. And 
what I'm going to describe to you today is some of that work, that journey over the last 20 years. What did I set out to do? What have I achieved? Can you uh, see yourself doing something like this in the future? And the last thing to tell you before I jump into this journey is when you're part of a Russell Group University, you are in the company of people who are doing research. Southampton is a Russell Group University. All of the, the academics are research scientists. They carry out research on an area that's close to their heart, an area of science that they have internationally been recognised for. And so when you then are taught, certainly in Southampton, it may be not the case in other Russell Group universities, but in Southampton, if you are taught about a subject that is the speciality of the person who's carrying out research, it will be that person who teaches you about that subject. So I've just finished giving the final year lectures on Alzheimer's disease. And what I'm going to share with you today was very much related to how I gave those lectures uh, last week. And some of those questions that are not answered when uh, s students, final year students, decide to do a project in my lab and they come to my lab to try and answer some of these questions that are still unanswered, they will be part of the publications that come out of my lab. Um, and I just want you to appreciate that a lot of what I'm going to describe to you was research done in my lab and in many instances, uh, project students were authors on those papers because they were part of the research team that delivered. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you were sitting right in front of me um, as a final year student in Southampton, I wouldn't just talk at you. I would pause and I would ask you questions. And the question I would ask you is how many of you have heard of Alzheimer's disease and what is Alzheimer's disease? Now, sadly, this is such a prevalent disease in our society that there are very few who haven't heard about this disease. Um, it's a disease that generally afflicts the elderly. It's considered to be most common in people over the age of 65. It's characterized clinically by memory loss. I'm going to try and see if my pointer works. Um, you can tell me if, OK, I'm going to put the laser pointer there. So Alan, is the laser pointer working? Yes, can we can yeah. see that, yeah. Okay. So this picture here is a picture of Auguste D. She was the first ever uh, recorded uh, patient who was who had what's now called Alzheimer's disease because she was being looked after by Professor August, uh, Professor Alois Alzheimer, a German neuro, neuro uh, clinical psychiatrist, old age psychiatrist, and she was in her mid fifties and she was a housewife who seemed to have forgotten how to carry on with day to day activities such that she really became almost like a recluse and couldn't really carry on with um, her life with looking after her house. So he um, uh, made very meticulous notes about the nature of her um, uh, clinical symptoms and most of the symptoms related to memory loss. And those are the typical symptoms of people who have Alzheimer's disease. When she died, he was able to note and these aren't, uh, this isn't her brain, but this would be typical of someone, of, would be typical, typically what the brain of someone who has Alzheimer's disease would look like. So if you looked at the brain of someone who has Alzheimer's disease compared to the brain of someone who's uh, of a similar age but has died, normally that's the brain on the bottom. There's a big difference. People with Alzheimer's disease have lots and lots of cell death, lots of holes, gaping holes in their brains, which are telling you that those were neurons, but those neurons have died because the brain has shriveled up and shrunken. He then sectioned her brain to look in more detail at structures inside her brain. And in those days, there was the um, industrial revolution in the textile industry, and there were lots of dyes that were starting to come out. And he was able to section her brain and stain them with different dyes. And this is a silver dick stain, which uh, stains proteins that accumulate. And you all know about proteins. Proteins are structures, uh, our, our proteins are uh, one of the belong to the class of biological molecules that form structures in our body, in our cells. Um, and he discovered that there were two proteins, one protein called a beta amyloid, a, a beta protein. It's a protein that's found in all of our brains. We don't yet know exactly what a beta protein does, but in people who have Alzheimer's disease, it seems to get deposited outside nerve cells. So nerve cells seem not to want this a beta protein. 
in the brains of people who have Alzheimer's disease, and they kind of throw it outside nerve cells where it just accumulates in clumps. He also described another protein called tau. Tau is a protein um, that usually is found inside axons of neurons. If you remember back to your uh, GCSE and A-level uh, neuro, neurobiology, nerve cells have a, a long structure called an axon. I'll show you a picture of an axon in a little while. And inside those axons, uh, a lot of uh, transport of important materials, neurotransmitters and other cargo is transported in those axons. Those axons contain this very important protein called tau. I've just drawn a cartoon of it here. And tau is the other protein that becomes abnormal in the brains of people who have Alzheimer's disease. For reasons we don't understand, it also forms these clumps, um, but this time it forms these rope-like clumpy structures inside nerve cells and it, these structures grow inside the nerve cells and eventually they squeeze the life out of the brain. So this is what Alois Alzheimer described uh, over 100 years ago now. And over this time, many questions have been posed about this disease. And again, if you were sitting in my lecture last week, I would have stopped and said, armed with this knowledge, what are the questions you might want to ask about the disease? Um, and so as you're not in front of me, I'll just assume that you'd be clever enough to ask me. The normal question to ask is, how does a normal protein like a beta protein or tau protein, how does it actually become abnormal in the first place so that it starts to become a plaque or a tangle as, as is described in Alzheimer's disease? That's one question. A second question is, how can you actually get when the, when the plaque and the tangle is formed, how do those structures kill the nerves? How does that lead to the clinical symptoms of memory loss? And another important question related to this is, do these structures, once they form, just kill the nerve cell? Or is there a period of time, potentially months, even years, when as these structures are forming inside nerve cells, the nerve cells are getting sick and then the nerve cells are not dead, but they're sick enough for that circuit in the brain not to work properly. And if that circuit happens to be a circuit that's involved in learning a memory, you then get problems with learning a memory. And I was, uh, when I did my PhD and started my postdoctoral training, I was actually very interested in asking how these structures, when they become abnormal, how they make nerve cells sick, because I believed and I still believe that if you can work out how a nerve, a neuron gets sick, and you can then find a way of preventing that, you can actually bring that circuit back to life. If the circuit is already dead because the neurons have died, you can't do anything to improve that circuit, to bring it back to life. The brain and the nerve neurons are one type of tissue where once the tissue dies, there's no regeneration. It's not like your liver where you could lose 25% of it and the remaining cells would um, just Div uh, divide and replenish the tissue that's lost. You can't do that in the brain. So I felt it more important to ask questions about how these abnormal proteins make nerve cells sick. And that's really what I'm going to tell you. These are the questions that we started to ask in my lab. And what I'm going to describe to you now are answers we got for asking this question, but it took several years to ask these questions. But where does the fruit fly come in? So before I tell you about the questions we asked and the answers we got, well, the fruit fly happens to be the model organism within which we chose to ask these questions. We couldn't ask these questions in adult brain because once the person is dead and you get to see their brain, you can't really, other than identifying the presence of plaques and tangles, there's very little more you can do to work out how uh, the normal cell became sick, how the normal A beta uh, became abnormal. You, you can't really do a lot of um, experimentation in normal human brain. Of course you can't. Um, and so the alternative is to recreate the abnormal tau or the abnormal amyloid. And I recreated the abnormal tau. So you recreate it in the brains of model organisms. You can recreate some of these structures in uh, dishes, in cells grown in dishes, but actually there is very limited information you'll get there. You're never going to be able to create a circuit in a dish and then see that circuit stop working. And then you're never in a dish going to have uh, 
a clinical symptom that comes out because a circuit has stopped working. You have to really recreate these structures in the brains of model organisms. And there are many, many model organisms that people use. They use rodents, some of them use um, uh, uh, primates even, some of them use worms. I settled on fruit flies and you may ask, why use the fruit fly? There are many, 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 many reasons why the fruit fly has actually been the, bi the biologist's friend for decades. Since the 1930s, we've, we, we as scientists have used fruit flies to better understand many biological processes that are actually uh, conserved across the species. So circadian rhythms, your body clock, your um, genetics, modern genetics, your inflammatory responses, um, a lot of these processes, though they occur at a much simpler level in the fruit fly, they are essentially preserved. A lot of what we know about the way that our, um, the way that our, all our bodily uh, structures develop during development has come from our knowledge, from knowledge that was gleaned from the fruit flies. A lot of what we know about many other important biological processes has come from experiments done in fruit flies because of this preservation, conservation of structure and function. And you'd be surprised to learn that 75% of genes that have been implicated in human disease, 75% of them have equivalent genes in the fly. So if you don't know what the gene is doing in the person, but you know that that's the gene responsible for the disease in the person, you can look for the equivalent gene in the fly. And because the fly is a lot simpler, you can manipulate that gene and find out what the consequence is by, of manipulating that gene. And as a result of this, you can work out the function of that gene. And then you get a better idea about the function that must have become impaired in the person who got the disease. And so you get a better understanding of the disease. And so the fly has many, many uh, homologues to human disease genes. Flies are very cheap. An experiment that you could do in a, a rodent um, would be a hundred times more expensive to do than to do it in fly because the fly is so short lived. You can really understand the whole spectrum of how the disease starts, how it affects the whole animal as it grows, ages, becomes old in the space of 60 days. That's how long a fly lives. Whereas to do that same experiment in a rodent would take you two years. To do that same experiment in a primate would take you 15 years. So you can really take advantage of its short lifespan. And the final thing is because flies have been used for several years, Scientists have devised some very elegant genetic tools that can allow you to manipulate genes in flies. And all of these tools don't exist for other model organisms because they've not been used as much. So we've not really created the technology for them. And we can use all of those tools in the fly. So armed with all of that, I was really, really keen to understand how when the protein tau becomes abnormal, how does it actually make the nerve cells sick? And I was really very excited to do these experiments and they became the experiments that I did um, straight after I finished my PhD. Um, and they became the experiments that I did um, as part of a, a fellow. So let's take a step or well, let's pause for a second. When a protein, so all of you having done A-level biology or doing A-level biology, Whenever you are taught about biological molecules, you're taught that each biological molecule category, or each type of biological molecule has a particular function. And tau is no different. It has a very, very important function. And you must appreciate that when a protein becomes abnormal, it's that function that first becomes affected. That's the theory. So if that's the theory, would this not be what happens in Alzheimer's disease? Well, what does tau normally do um, in axons? Tau normally, as I told you, is a protein found within the axon. So to remind you again of what an ax uh, a neuron looks like, you've got the cell body, which is the housekeeping hub where all the reactions in the cell occur. You've got the synapse where neurotransmitters are released. You've got the action potential generated in the cell body, which then propagates down this axon and gets to the synapse where neurotransmitters are released. But that neurotransmitter has to get there somehow. It's made in the cell body. It's then packaged into vesicles, which then are transported down microtubules through the axon. So the axon's a bit like the highway of the cell of the neuron where important material cargo is transported. 
And this, these tracks over which the cargo is transported are usually quite unstable. They break down very easily. And so they need proteins like tau. And tau is the major protein that stabilizes tracks. So they need microtubule stabilizing tracks, uh, proteins like tau, which stabilize the tracks and keep them intact so that cargo can be transported down these uh, proteins. So if you were sitting in my lecture theatre, I would now say to you, armed with that knowledge, if I now ask you when tau is abnormal, as it is in Alzheimer's disease, what do you predict will happen? And I would hope that like the very good students that I taught last week, you can tell me one prediction. And that prediction would be that maybe the tracks would break down. And if the tracks break down, maybe exonal transport would become disrupted. And indeed, to um, tell you uh, very quickly, what we found is we created these transgenic animals that had, um, we inserted a, a, a green fluorescent protein genetically into cargo that's transported up and down tracks. We selected a circuit where there were very nice long axons and we visualized those axons in animals that only had the tagged um, green fluorescent protein tagged cargo. And there was very nice spread of vesicles all the way up and down that uh, those axons suggesting that the axon transport was intact. But in animals that were expressing tau, this is the tau exactly as it looks in the brain of someone who has Alzheimer's disease. These axons were still alive. I could tell they were still alive because I still saw some vesicles bobbing up and down these axons because I did this experiment so that the um, animal was still alive. I just anesthetized the animal and was able to look through the skin of the animal. Um, that's the other advantage of doing these experiments in larvae. They have transparent skins, so you can look through their skins to see if axonal transport, uh, if there is an effect on uh, transport. And I could see some vesicles were bobbing in between these traffic jams, but it's a bit like looking at the M25 at rush hour. So at this time, if we put a helicopter up and looked at the M25, it would look like this. If we looked at the M25 in the middle of the night, it should look like this. There might not be as many vehicle, uh, vehicles on the N25 at that time, but whichever ones there are, they won't be stuck in traffic jams. So it was very clear to us, to me, that when you have abnormal tau in the in a nerve cell, in a circuit, this is what it does. It clogs up the axons. And um, I found that the more abnormal I make the tau, the more this axonal transport deficit became greater. So I tried to do that here by just uh, these. This bar here um, is really looking at um, adding, making the tau more and more abnormal. And you see that when the tau is abnormal to a small extent, it's still got a lot of traffic jams compared to controls. But if I um, looked at the tau um, in animals that uh, have had a lot of, uh, was e where the tau was even more abnormal because I introduced a greater degree of abnormality in it, then the deficit became worse. Um, and so I then asked myself, what, how does this abnormal tau disrupt exonal transport? I can see that it's disrupting exonal transport, but how does it do it? I had two hypotheses. My first hypothesis was that when the tau is abnormal, the vesicles, uh, the, the, when the tau is abnormal, it actually comes off the tracks because its normal job is it should bind the tracks. So remember, tau's normal job is it binds these microtubular tracks and keeps them stable. And we predicted that when tau is abnormal, that particular function of tau should not be able to be carried out. So we predicted that its ability to bind to microtubules would break down and um, the microtubule cytoskeleton should also then collapse. And that was really one of our two hypotheses. We had another hypothesis too, but I'm not going to go through that just in the interest of time. So how did we test that first hypothesis? Well, we did very high resolution microscopy. And again, you've learned about microscopy in your, um, uh, I think you learn about microscopy in key stage three. I think you do a little bit more at GCSE. 
And I think at A-level, you also learn a little bit about the different microscopic techniques. But we essentially used electron microscopy so that we could look at the very high resolution at the intactness of the cytoskeleton. And if you imagine this is a bundle of nerves coming out of the screen and I've sliced them. And when I slice them, if the microtubular cytoskeleton is intact, the microtubules appear as cylindrical structures. Um, and this is what the cytoskeleton looks like in normal animals. Now, when we looked at the cytoskeleton in animals where you had those huge pileups and traffic jams, look, this is what it looked like. A massive difference. Again, if you're sitting right in front of me, I would ask you, what is the difference between these two animals? And hopefully you would tell me here, there are lots of intact cylinders suggesting that the microtubular cytoskeleton is intact here. There are very few intact cylinders telling you that the microtubular cytoskeleton has broken down. And indeed, that's true. And um, when we sent this paper and at the bottom of each of my results slides, I've put down the publication in case you want to look at it. When we send this publication, this paper away to be published, the reviewers told us, um, Dr. Mudda, this is what a normal axon bundle should look like. This one is one that's just been shattered. We are pretty sure that you used a fixative that was very harsh for the tissue. So the fixative has destroyed the tissue here, and this is where you used a good fixative. Please go and repeat these experiments using the same fixative that you used here. And we went back and said to them, we actually do our experiments properly. This experiment was done with exactly the same fixative. The uh, person doing the experiments was blinded as to whether they were looking at or processing a normal lava or a tire expressing lava, and the same fixative was used in both instances. This is a real result. This is what a sick neuron looks like. And imagine if this is true and you can extend it to the brain of someone who has Alzheimer's disease, then at those early stages in, uh, of the disease, when the tau in those circuits is abnormal, those people with Alzheimer's disease potentially have very broken down um, cytoskeletons in their neurons. And so this is very likely to be a, a real result. Um, I haven't got the data here to, um, I, in fact, I haven't got the time, which is why I didn't include the data. We looked at what the consequence of having no abnormal tau was um, in that animal. We looked at the behavior of the animal and we found that this animal had um, the neurotransmitter release from these axons was very much impaired. They were still alive, so it's still releasing neurotransmitter, but they were very impaired compared to this one. Their behavior was very abnormal. And we could relate all of this to this being because the tau was abnormal, because if you treated these animals with uh, a chemical that reduced the abnormal state of the tau, they went to went, went back to looking like they were normal. So if you want to know more about that, then please do look at this publication. What I want to do now is I want to tell you, having got this information about how an abnormal, abnormal protein makes the nerve cell sick, how can you use that information to create a drug? How can you use that information to design a therapy? That's really what I ultimately wanted to do. Um, and so again, if you were sitting in front of me, I would ask you and my final year students, when I asked them, I was very proud of them, that they were able to suggest therapies. And one of the therapy that was suggested was a therapy that we actually tried. And this is, can we use microtubule stabilizing drugs? And microtubule stabilizing drugs are used to treat cancer patients where the microtubule cytoskeleton there is used by dividing cells. And so if you just overstabilize the microtubule cytoskeleton in dividing cells, then you stop the cancer cells from dividing. And so we used the same approach here. We used a, a microtubule stabilizing drug called paclitaxel, or the drug that we actually used was another one called NAP. And we predicted that if you put the tracks back together, axonal transport should improve. And we did that experiment again. This was published three years later. This again is the electron microscopy of a, a, an axon bundle of an animal that was expressing tau but didn't have the drug. And this is a sibling of the same animal, but this time we treated the sibling with the drug and look at how remarkably the microtubules have been reinstated. 
And this drug went into clinical trial. And in people who had mild cognitive impairment, there was a, an improvement in their memory scores. And so this is a very nice example of how a drug that you, uh, of, of how you, a scientist carries out an experiment mm -hmm. to work out how the cell gets sick. You use that information to think of how you can stop that process. And that, that then becomes a drug that is put through toxicity tests and then goes into clinical trial and the doctor delivers it. If I would carried on with medicine, I would have been the doctor delivering the drug and it would have given me a lot of um, satisfaction to have interacted with people and treated them. But I am also very satisfied and perhaps I feel like I'm more satisfied in working out how the cells got sick and then being the one to devise the drug, to find the drug that can then treat millions of people down the line. So um, in the last uh, three or four minutes, I'm just going to tell you about other projects that are in my lab at the moment. So we've looked at other drugs as well. Um, one of the other drugs that we um, examined was uh, what the, the, the work two drugs, the, these were antioxidant drugs, vitamin E and vitamin C, and we looked at those because it's quite well known now that people who uh, consume the Mediterranean diet, um, they seem to be protected from Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things about the Mediterranean diet is it's quite rich in antioxidants like vitamin E and vitamin C. And so we wanted to know whether treating our drugs, our animals, our tau expressing animals with these drugs may have any beneficial effect. We published this in 2020. And indeed, we find that that is the case. This was now, so by this time we had, we had advanced in our uh, equipment and we were no longer uh, looking at those maggots manually. We were now tracking their movements with automated, semi-automated systems, and we would really place our maggot in the middle, in the middle of a, um, a, a plate, and we would then record how far it moves in uh, 90 seconds, and a tau expressing animal that was only given the vehicle, but wasn't really given the drug, was very stunted in how far it uh, travels, falls, because if you remember, this is the animal that would have had the breakdown of the cytoskeleton that would have had with some transport deficit. But as you treat this animal with increasing doses of vitamin E or with higher dose of vitamin C, there's a dramatic improvement in how far it moves. And that tells you that, yes, there might be something about the Mediterranean diet that is helping the tau. We subsequently looked at how it's improving the tau itself and we found that it is making the tau less abnormal and that's possibly why we're having all these improvements. We then also tried very recently and this is work that we're currently writing up and there are two uh, master students um, on this uh, publication uh, and in the previous publication there were some undergraduate students as well and um, where we've looked at the effect of anti-diabetic drugs. And the reason to do this is because it's well known that people who have um, type 2 diabetes are twice as likely, up to twice as likely to get Alzheimer's disease. And so the suggestion there is that the processes that give rise to diabetes also make your tau protein abnormal. And so we hypothesized that if you took it, if you uh, then used that knowledge and turned it to its head, the anti-diabetic drugs actually improve that cellular pathway um, and that's how it's a treatment for diabetes. Should it then also not improve the tau and make the tau less abnormal? So we tried anti-diabetic drugs and these are uh, animals that are fed different anti-diabetic drugs. And if you look at the left hand side, this was a be the behavior of adults as they aged adult flies. Um, the ones in the dark colours were the ones that were fed just a vehicle, so they were not given any drug at all. Um, and their climbing behaviour just decrease, decreases with time just because the flies get old. And um, the ones in the pink were given the anti-diabetic drug, but again, they didn't have the towel, so they, their behaviour also declined. But having the drug didn't really make any difference to control flies. But look at the dramatic difference in the towel flies. So, the tau flies are those that are in green, 
the green bars and these are green, these are tau flies that have not fed any drug. And these flies have much reduced locomotor uh, behavior. Their climbing ability is much decreased anyway because they have those external transport deficits and therefore they're going to have um, an inability to climb as well. But if you feed them this anti-diabetic drug, very common anti-diabetic drug, metformin, there's a remarkable improvement in their climbing ability. It still declines, but at every time point, metformin-fed flies are improving far more than tau, uh, than, than, than non-metformin-fed tau flies. Um, and so we're very happy about that, and we're currently going to writing that up. Um, there's a last um, project there. I'm not going to describe that in any great detail because we've run out of time, except to say that we're also looking at drugs that make the tau less pathological directly. So we know that the tau is pathological in a number of ways in the brains of people who have Alzheimer's disease. One of the ways is it's aggregated. I told you it forms those rope-like structures inside our nerve cells, and we are currently I, my my uh, PhD student who just started in my lab in September, uh, wonderful chap, very keen to do this work, very exciting project as well. He's looking at whether treating these uh, tau animals with inhibitors of aggregation, if you stop that rope-like structure forming, does it improve them? And um, where I'll be, you know, if I give this talk again in three years' time, then I'll describe his data. Okay, so. My last slide then, what has the humble fly told us about Alzheimer's disease? Well, in my mind, when I was your age, I wanted to do something to better understand human disease. I feel I've done that. With this humble fruit fly model, I've been able to understand how nerve cells get sick in Alzheimer's disease. I also, when I was your age, wanted to do something that helped people. Um, and I feel that the information that we've got from this model can provide us with drug targets that could be used to design drugs. And in the future, other drugs could also be tested in the models that I've described, that I've created before they're tested for toxicity in rodents and humans. And um, that's my email address. These are the societies that have funded this research. And research is not done free of charge uh, because it's costly and funding organizations, especially charities. We are greatly indebted to charities, the Alzheimer's Society of Diabetes UK and Gerald Kirker Trust. That's my talk, uh, 36 minutes, minutes, Alan. Over to you, Alan. All right. Thank you very much, Amrit. Uh, that was a really, really interesting talk. I think, you know, thinking about a, a humble fruit fly that many of us view as a bit of a nuisance during the summer buzzing around our fruit bowls and we get a bit annoyed about it but it's really interesting to see how you've used that very humble organism and really addressing some of the key issues that are affecting society in terms of, of Alzheimer's disease so it's really interesting to hear about that that research. Um, we've got a few questions in the in the chat um, so I'll I'll just pose those to you. Um, so I've got an interesting one talking about um, whether we can get useful information from living patients that have Alzheimer's through doing brain scans and whether we can learn anything from, from looking at those living brains. Yeah, thanks, Alan. That's a very good question. Um, indeed, we are now not relying just on patients who have died and who've donated their brains to understand disease. We can also look at living patients and indeed these living patients do get uh, brain scans as part of their diagnosis. So if somebody, if the clinician thinks that they've got Alzheimer's disease or a different type of dementia where a different region of the brain is affected, they do get brain scans to see where the pathology is. And that does tell us something about the disease, no doubt. You can learn where in the brain the disease starts. We now know that it starts in, for Alzheimer's disease, we know it starts at the back of your ears and then it spreads to different regions of the brain. And we've only been able to learn that from brain scans. Um, you can also learn about how um, if a drug is successful. So very recently, there have been some studies done where in clinical trials, drugs have been shown to improve the memory scores. 
you can look in the brains of those people about whether or not the pathology in the brain has been reduced as they get better. So definitely these brain scans are very useful. They are very much part of the, uh, the, the, the procedures for the patients and can help us better understand disease. But they are limited in that A, they're very expensive, they're laborious and very uncomfortable for patients, but you're only going to get information from them. You're not going to be able to use them experimentally. You can get information from scans and then work out whether a drug was successful or not. You can learn a bit about the disease, but really you, they can't replace animal models. They can be used to validate what you find in the animal. Does it work in the person? So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, and we've got another really interesting question as well. It asking to what extent can we actually generalize the fly research to humans, especially in drug development? So I guess this is saying you know, a fly is very different from a human. So can we really use the information we get in the fly and apply that directly to humans? Or is it a bit more complicated than that? Again, a very good question. You would absolutely never replace the rodent or the human with a drug you designed in the fly and then <coughs> take it to the human. Absolutely not. But the fly is useful for doing the broad scale studies that you don't need to do in rodents. So if you wanted to test. Uh, so first of all, we have to believe that what you find in the fly is relevant to people. It's relevant, first of all, to rodents and then it's relevant to people because rodents and people, humans are vertebrates, flies are invertebrates. You need to first confirm that the pathway that you find affected in the fly is also affected in humans. And we know that that's the case. I can't. There are very few pathways that are not conserved across the species. And so with many of the models, not just of Alzheimer's disease, but of models of different diseases, you often find that when there's a readout that comes out from the fly, a rodent experiment has been done either by the people who did the fly work or through their collaborators or by other people completely that prove that whatever else you saw in the fly also works in humans. So axonal transport deficits, for example, have been re reported in rodent models too. And then you validate, does this also is this also what's seen in people? So if you look in post-mortem brain for evidence of axonal transport deficits, you'll see it. So, so pathologically speaking, you see the same pathology in each instance, but with the dis drugs as well, these drugs, I told you, the microtubule stabilizing drug, it worked in flies, it worked in rodents, and it also worked in people. And that there are many examples in multiple models of flies, not just for Alzheimer's disease, but for other models too, where drugs that were tested in the fly worked in models of Huntington's disease, in models of cancer even, um, many other models. So yes, a lot of what you learn in the fly does hold true in rodents and does hold true in vertebrates, but you should use the fly to understand the disease better, to try many, many drugs, but you wouldn't ultimately take it straight from the fly to the person. You need to go through the rodents so that you just have peace of mind that it is really also holding true and that there's no toxicity. Just because it's not toxic to a fly, you'd imagine it not be toxic to a rodent and to a person, but you want to do that test first. So just to follow up on that, this is a, a, my question. Um, is, are there any examples where actually the fly brain has turned out to behave quite differently to the human brain or to the mouse brain, for example? So you found out something in the fly and then it, it turned out it was completely different in a different system. Um, there are some situations where the simplicity of the fly brain um, actually uh, is not directly relevant. So, for example, for many genes, you have isoforms. So, again, in A-level biology, you learned that a gene can be alternatively spliced to give you different proteins that are allele. You know, that there are sort of isoforms. In the fly, because it's very simple, you will have, so the tau protein, in, in rodents, there are four isoforms of the tau protein. In humans, there are six. In the fly, there's just one. So if you knocked out the tau protein or the tau gene in the fly, you would see effects immediately. But if you did that in the rodent or the human, there are other isoforms that get upregulated to compensate. So the complexity that muddies the picture in people, and sometimes that complexity is why you don't pick the disease up for a long time because other proteins are coming in there and compensating and taking over. 
you don't see that in the fly. So you could be led to believe things are very simple in the fly, but actually some of it is complex. Other things also are slightly different. So there are no antibodies produced in the inflammatory response in flies. Does not you you don't have the um, you don't have uh, there's no acquired immunity. It's only innate immunity, which means that you have phagocytosis, but you don't have uh, antibody production and many neurodegenerative diseases and other diseases will also have antibody, uh, the immune response involved where antibodies are being released and you won't be able to study those aspects, for example, in flies. OK, right, we've got some other get back to the, uh, the questions from our visitors. Um, so we've got uh, another question here. Does the Mediterranean diet protect against Alzheimer's or can it also be used for patients who are already suffering with the condition? I'm really glad you asked this question because often with some diseases and with Alzheimer's disease, people think, OK, there's there's no there's no hope. But actually there is because just last year I was at a conference where this very question was posed. So well done to you to be asking a question that a scientist has also asked and tested. And what they did was they said, we don't know whether it's the Mediterranean diet per se that's prevented the disease or whether it's the sunshine in the Mediterranean or the interaction with their neighbors or something else and not the diet that's protecting them. So what these scientists did was they did a clinical trial where they created packages of the Mediterranean diet and they were delivered to people living in England who had Alzheimer's disease and they were very much on the clinical trial like they could not eat anything else they had to only consume what they were sent in the post because they were part of the trial and they really wanted to know whether it's the tr drug itself that the, the food itself and absolutely it was all of those people they never got better but where they would decline every year they, their decline became less steep and so they sort of they didn't get as bad as they would if they had had if they hadn't had the Mediterranean diet. So it was protecting them. And then when the trial stopped and they weren't giving them these food parcels anymore, they still looked at them a year later and a year later they were still better than they would have been. Um, uh, you know, if they had not been introduced to the Mediterranean diet. And you don't know whether that's because they started to like the Mediterranean diet and then started in consuming Mediterranean food anyway, or because the antioxidant effects of the Mediterranean diet persisted. But it's certainly something that is very, very much advocated. I certainly would advocate it to anybody who is worried about Alzheimer's. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, right, next question that we've got is how did you figure out the link between type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's? So I personally <coughs> didn't figure it out. We are all drops in this big ocean, but we, the drops, make the ocean. So it's been known for a while and how these links come about is through what are called epidemiological studies where people look at how prevalent any one disease is in any one area and then they look at that area and see what about that area makes the disease more prevalent and in this way it was found that people who had who were coming to the clinicians and were getting diagnosed with us with Alzheimer's disease tended to have type 2 diabetes and so the clinicians then were able to do clinical uh, linkage studies and found that amongst people with type 2 diabetes the prevalence of Alzheimer's was one and a half to two times more than it was in 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 the lay public in, in the lay uh, in people who didn't have type 2 diabetes and so that's how those original findings came up and it was reported by other people and um, I became interested in this work because it so happens that the pathway the glycogen synthase kinase that is the kinase which which is implicated in type 2 diabetes, that is also a kinase that can make the tau protein abnormal. And so I thought it very interesting that in people with type 2 diabetes, that kinase becomes overactive. And guess what? In Alzheimer's disease, this protein is more phosphorylated than it should. And so perhaps the two are related and therefore we did this study. But I can't take the credit for this. Many, many other people are doing similar studies. I'm the only one doing it in flies for sure. And then sort of linked to this a little bit, how does vitamin C and vitamin E help in preventing microtubule degradation? I think so. So that's that's a very good question again. And we haven't yet looked at the impact of microtubules stable. We haven't looked to see whether microtubules are more stabilized in those animals that got better and whether their exonal transport is also better. But 
what we do know is that the antioxidant, mm -hmm. that oxidative stress is oxidative stress is something that you may or may not have learned <laughs> in A levels. I don't know, but it's when you've got um, in inappropriate uh, mitochondrial function, right? So mitochondria are very important for respiration and they're important for making ATP. But sometimes when that goes wrong, you have uh, free radicals produced and free radicals are little charged ions for want of another word that they are not supposed to be released if if respiration is occurring properly but if respiration isn't occurring properly they're released and then they go around and cause a lot of damage. Antioxidants are things like vitamin C and vitamin E that can mop them up and basically make them inert and so we think that when the tau is abnormal and it's highly phosphorylated and therefore it's not able to go and bind to microtubules, we think that that's probably what the antioxidants are doing. It's just making them more normal. So yes, the next experiment to do would be to check whether when the tau is more normal, is it binding to microtubules better? We haven't done that, but it would it would be my prediction that that's what's happening. OK, and then sort of talking a bit about manipulating tau, so really interesting question, one I had thought of as well, um, so it's really good to see someone's asked that, is um, do flies naturally exhibit Alzheimer's? So can you test a fly if it's got Alzheimer's or are you inducing that Alzheimer's like effect by manipulating tau? And if you do it by manipulating tau, how do you do that? So, um... By Alzheimer's disease by definition is a disease of humans and so all we are doing is creating modeling an aspect of Alzheimer's disease. We are making one of the proteins in a circuit abnormal in the same way that it is abnormal in the brain of someone who has Alzheimer's and we are then looking to see whether that circuit becomes dysfunctional. However, the fly is a very complex organism and it participates in a lot of complex behaviors, right? It engages in courtship behavior. It engages in um, learning and memory because they have to remember where to go for their food, food sources. It engages in aggressive behavior. Uh, the male courts the female. There are many, many things. And as with uh, humans and other animals, there's an age related decline in all of these behaviors. So I showed you the graph where their locomotor behavior declines with age just in normal flies. So normal flies should also have an age related decline in all cognitive faculties, Cognitive is a bit of a stretch here, but all the faculties that require that regulate complex behaviors. So they should get an age related decline in learning and memory. Whether that then ever makes them unable to do what a fly should do successfully, I don't know whether that research has been done, but certainly my collaborators have set ups for learning and memory and they look at how the fly can also get learning and memory deficits. The fly has its own Drosophila tau, and we have done an experiment where we have made the fly's own Drosophila tau abnormal in the same way that we made the human tau abnormal, and that fly looks just like the human tau abnormal fly. It has the same behavioral and axonal transport deficits. Okay. Right, we've got four more questions and I think we've got about seven minutes, so we're on about two minutes a question now. All right, so we've got an interesting question here. I saw a case in China that a 19 year old teenager had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And the question really is, is it possible that Alzheimer's disease is gradually happening at a younger age and we only really see it manifesting as natural disease in older age? So are younger people also developing these these symptoms right. hidden? Younger people do can also get Alzheimer's disease, but that's often a familial form. So that person must have had a familial form of disease. 15% of Alzheimer's disease is familial, where you've inherited a gene that will give you the disease, and those people can get it much younger. The early, youngest case I'd heard of was 27, but it would not surprise me if the 27 was when the symptoms appeared, but they started much earlier. So that person you saw was probably someone who had a familiar disease, sporadic form of Alzheimer's disease in the way that I've described to you, I don't think there's any evidence that it appears in young people. OK. Um, and we've got a question here about whether there's a difference between tau in males and females. We're talking about humans here and whether that gives a higher risk level to women compared with men. 
women are far more likely to get Alzheimer's disease than men, but that's, I think, because women live, outlive men. So Alzheimer's disease is far more, you know, one in 16 people over the age of 60 will get Alzheimer's, one in three over the age of 90 will get Alzheimer's. But I think that there are many more 90-year-old women than there are 90-year-old men, and that's why the women are more likely to get it. I don't think the tau is different, but there are some, there is some evidence that the estrogen levels and other hormonal differences may play a role in making the tau more or less pathological. But I think it's just to do with women outliving men. Okay. Um, and then going back to, we were talking a little bit about familial disease and how it's inherited. So we've got a, a question here linked with that. Um, so to what extent is Alzheimer's disease inherited? And if so, could we use sort of CRISPR-Cas type technology maybe to modify the genome and actually eradicate the, the disease? So whilst the strict familial form of disease where there's a dominant inheritance where you know if you've got the gene, then you will get the disease, that type of inheritance is only in about 15% of individuals. Having said that, we are now understanding that there are many more genes that are risk genes, that APOE4 is one you may have heard about. It's a, There are many, many risk genes that are now coming out that will increase your chances of getting Alzheimer's, but it doesn't mean that if you're homozygous for those risk genes, you will get the disease. So they're just risk genes. Um, and so the risk genes are known and there are several of them, but using CRISPR-Cas, you'd have to better understand how the risk gene interferes with tau or amyloid to be able to introduce CRISPR-Cas. And secondly, I think we're, certainly in my lifetime, I don't think CRISPR-Cas will be advanced enough for us to do gene editing in people because there are other off-target effects that could lead to other consequences of gene editing. You could have cancers starting to appear or some other detrimental effects. So I don't know that CRISPR-Cas will be the solution, but even before that, you have to first understand how the risk gene is giving you the disease. Yeah, and that sort of genetic modification of humans certainly opens up a whole can of worms of bioethical questions and whether it's right to do that sort of manipulation and whether it could be taken further as well, um, be used for other less um, noble causes, um, shall we say. So it opens up a whole whole series of, of questions. Um, there was another question I've actually replied to in the chat, um, and this was asking whether we provide support to students um, where they may be taking modules where there are sensitive topics that they may find distressing. I think that's um, certainly something that, uh, I, I mean, Alan is the uh, our deputy head of mm. school as well, so he would agree with me in that we take our, um, we, we take uh, student support and mental health very seriously. And if there is something that's being taught that is that you find sensitive, then you, you should approach the you should approach the uh, your personal tutor in the first instance, because your personal tutor would be able to advise you and then you'd have some interaction with the module mm -hmm. coordinator. So I coordinate this module or I, rather I used to until this year. I have handed it over this year after several years. But when I used to coordinate this module of the biology of neurodegenerative diseases, if someone told me that they were worried, I'd talk them through why they're worried. Um, because you have to understand the disease and a lot of times our worries are unfounded. Um, and, and if there was something that was worrying them beyond what I could offer them, then we've got enabling services, which is a support system where they can get professional help. And then the advice would be not to take that module if it's causing concern. Yeah, and, and more sort of generally, you know, we provide information about the content of modules, especially the ones that you're choosing as optional modules. Um, so you're well informed beforehand about what the content of that module is going to be and what sort of topics it's going to cover. So it might be that you decide having got that information, actually it's not really one for me and decide to do a different module. Um, instead. Um, we just had a couple more questions come in quickly. So one asking if Alzheimer's disease is sex linked or autosomal. It's not sex linked at all, but the linkage with the sex is just because women outlive men, as I said in the past, but there's no direct evidence of it being sex linked in any other way. Yeah. OK, and then another question. Uh, I'm currently researching Alzheimer's for an IAS. I'm not quite sure what 
that is exactly, but it's uh, obviously a, an A-level sort of type qualification, I presume. Um, and asking if there are any research pub papers published by Southampton I can review. Well, I think Amrit's exactly the person to to contact. And um, so this uh, yeah. this talk is recorded, uh, I believe, and you will you can ask for the recording to be sent to you. And every publication that I have cited, I have put the PM, uh, PubMed ID number at the bottom so that you can go back and look at all of those publications. And if you still want to know about more papers that uh, you know, I'm I'm just one person who works on Alzheimer's disease in Southampton. I can think off the top of my head of three other people that work on Alzheimer's disease just in biological sciences. But then we've also got clinical neurosciences over in the Faculty of Medicine who, where people also work on Alzheimer's disease. Other people in our department work on Parkinson's disease uh, and other diseases of the brain. And yes, there are many publications that I could uh, put your way. Um, but I think the thing that you, you must all appreciate, which is why we set these set webinar series is if you came to Southampton, this is the kind of interaction that you would have with us with whatever subject you're being taught. So I'm talking to you about Alzheimer's disease because that's my research area. I will teach those lectures. If you were given a talk by Max Crispin, who gave this seminar series last year, he's working on he was work, he's working on COVID and how how the vaccinations uh, affect the protein. Somebody else, Neil Gosling, works on uh, identification of new species of dinosaurs. Whatever it is that the researcher is researching on, that's what you would be able to get out of that person through a direct interaction in the lectures, but also through working with them in the lab. So all this research has been contributed to by students in my lab. OK, all right. Thank you, Amrit. Um, I think we've actually come to the end of our allotted time. We've just gone a minute over six o'clock, but we had some really, really interesting questions there following up from Amrit's talk. So I hope you found that um, interesting and informative. Um, hopefully we'll welcome some of you to open days and visit days in the future. If you make applications to Southampton or you've already done so, uh, we have a, a visit day happening this weekend. So perhaps some of you will be coming to that. And we can meet you and both Amrit and myself will be there. So we'd be more than happy to talk with you further if you come on on Saturday. But if you're thinking about making an application to Southampton and you've become really excited um, by this talk and what you've heard, then we'll certainly look forward to seeing you in the future. So I think at this point we will close the meeting. We'll close the, um, the webinar. Um, thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for taking part, asking questions and uh, hope you have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Bye-bye.